Hey ladies, just want to remind you to get on the wait list for the HA Society. It opens every new moon. This means it's opening on August the 8th. That's actually much earlier than usual. So if you are not on the wait list just yet, make sure you head to the show notes or go to the HA Society.com forward slash waitlist and get on it. It is a community where girls who do not have their period come together and we do weekly community calls. We have special events with practitioners. It's a bunch of resources. Like I have provided for you an amazing fertility awareness method course, the whole shebang. So come on in if you want to get your period back with a bunch of girls who get it. Thehasociety.com forward slash waitlist. Okay, let's get into this. Hey guys, and welcome back to another Q&A about HA. So I posted asking for some questions last week and here we have got a bunch. Snap Foods asks, vaccination, is it safe for someone with HA or not? So I'm not a doctor and I can't, you know, give you that answer. And I'm not sure anyone's really sure, but many of us have been hearing about the interesting things, the interesting challenges popping up with the vaccine and cycles. So I wouldn't say it's unsafe by any means, you know, uh, way up the risks here. Like if getting COVID is a higher risk to you than not getting your period back next week, then, you know, that's your call and only you can make that decision. But I would say that the vaccine's pretty important. So if you want to get it, go and get it. And just note that yes, it may mess with your cycle a little bit, whether you have one or not, but it's only temporary. I've had a few clients already send me their charts, their fertility awareness tracking, cycle tracking charts, and we have seen a massive temperature spike that has taken a few days to come down almost as though they have a fever. So we honestly have just had to put those temperatures aside or even just put the whole chart aside um, for about a week or even up to two weeks just till we see the chart normalize again. So in terms of getting your, your cycle back or getting it back on track, you're most likely only setting yourself back a week or two, at least in trying to track progress. Then if you get the vaccine, and you're trying to get your cycle back using the all-in method or you know whatever your protocol is just keep going just take this just take the vaccine rest up extra especially if you're not feeling good and just keep going with the protocol elizabeth asks how to fully commit to recovery without going from one extreme to the other this has been a huge topic of conversation for us lately in the IJ society, at least at the time of me filming this. And to go from one extreme to the other is a huge, hugely common thing to happen. You know, we're already sometimes type A people or just have an obsessive tendency and we were all in in diet and exercise and now we want to be all in and getting our cycle back and doing all of the things opposite. And it can feel a little bit like, oh, I'm obsessive. (laughs) I'm getting a bit obsessive about all of this. So if you're finding that that's happening, I do have a couple of things for you. One is to just note that this is temporary and you're going to get over it like most good things. And and HA recovery is not as addictive (laughs) as exercise and dieting is because there is an end to it. You know, when you get your cycle back and when things are back on track, you do stop worrying so much. And there is a part of you that remains forever aware of cycle health and the risks and always checking in on your cycle and making sure everything's okay. But that's actually ideal and normal. So I don't think it's necessarily wise to have the goal of getting your period back and then never having to think about your period again or, you know, going back hoping that you'll arrive back in a time mentally where it's not something that you ever worry about, that's probably not going to happen. The level of worry you have versus just awareness is probably going to change and you're most likely to be able to approach your cycle with a much less worrisome, nervous, anxious mindset. But the path there is to kind of sit through the slog now of being, you know, extra cautious. This is new. 
this is interesting, this is exciting, and that's why you're, you know, obsessed with it at the moment. But, you know, you're going to binge all these videos and listen to every podcast episode and read all of the books and the blogs and you're going to cap out on the amount of information you need to learn. You're going to get your period back and you're going to move on. So if you're having a hard time with the obsession piece, a part of you can also just accept it. You know, just accept that this is what's interesting to you right now and this is where you're at. Now, if you do want to try and step away from some of these things, I would honestly just recommend putting some boundaries around how much of the content you consume. For the girls in the AJ society, you know, I remind them that there's a reason when you come in that this isn't a place that's filled to the brim with resources and courses and workbooks and things for you to do because I don't want you to spend every minute of every day in here thinking about this kind of thing. We come together once or twice a week to do a community call or an event and we talk about the topics. We recenter on what's important and then you know we disperse again and go about our lives and we're here for you to message me or to comment and get support from the girls if you have a particular issue coming up like a triggering moment has happened or you have a genuine question or you have a doctor's appointment and you want some advice so in that sense you know it's great to have a place to go to get the information you need but it's great to be able to walk away from it as well. So that's you know why we design it that way, to stop people from being too obsessive about it. So if you're consuming a lot of content on the internet about AJ, that could be a part of the problem. So winding back, weaning off of that, and introducing something else for you to be focused on is really important. I can't tell you how many times I've you know, spent every waking <laughs> minute focused on something that I'm interested in and then had a project come up like at work that's really involved or a house like a DIY project I need to do all weekend and it pulls me away from the thing that I'm obsessing about. So I do recommend finding something to steal your attention away. Hallie asks, is it beneficial to stop all walking and exercise? Yes, it is. If you are trying to get your period back ASAP, the evidence shows that by stopping altogether, you're going to see progress sooner, most likely. Now, is it going to be extremely hazardous to stop walking and doing any exercise? You know, no, it's not going to be extremely hazardous, but it's up to you and what you know about yourself and what you need to strike a balance that's going to work for you. Some people absolutely can get their cycle back and maintain some form of exercise, albeit probably very much reduced. But if you want to get your cycle back ASAP, you know, I would recommend putting a complete stop to that kind of thing. If you're going to go for a walk or do some exercise, which let's face it, it's a little bit unavoidable sometimes, especially if you're in HA for a long time, like how are you never going to go for a walk with someone? In that case, just make sure you're eating right before you go and right after you finish. If you are going to do some exercise at some point, eat before you start and after you finish. And that's the most important thing you can do if you're doing a little bit of walking or exercise during recovery. Constance asks, HA and bone health, why does it depend on the level of HA? Does the birth control pill also cause bone loss? So I'm not 100% sure what you mean by the level of HA. You either have HA or you don't. We do sometimes talk about the idea that you could just be closer to recovery than someone else is. For example, you might have more follicle development. You might have been you know, only recently diagnosed with HA and you had a period not that long ago and now you don't. And you know, these things can... So maybe you mean like time spent having had HA and why does that matter? So let's assume it's that. Obviously, just the longer amount of time that you don't have a period, longer amount of time that you have HA, the more amount of time you have had to experience bone loss. So, you know, that's why that matters. And in terms of the birth control pill causing bone loss, you know, I'm actually not a huge birth control expert. There are definitely better people to talk about the effects of the birth control pill, but we can say that, you know, they're fake steroidal hormones and they're not giving your body exactly what the natural version will give you. 
And if anything, you know, the pill is suppressing the hormones that are really important for maintaining bone density and bone health. So by being on the pill, you are not receiving or your body is not receiving what it needs to receive to maintain healthy bone, to put it very simply. There is evidence to show that if you're experiencing bone loss and you have a history of like resistance training like I did, you are less likely to experience the same amount of bone loss as someone who has HA and was a distance runner or uh, someone doing aerobic. So I think that's really interesting about bone density and HA. But apart from that, if you don't have a period, you're probably experiencing some form of bone loss but not everyone does or at least not as quickly as others do but yeah it's something really important to keep looking into Daphne asks dating in recovery and during a weight gain phase although I realize that you had Jake okay so Jake is my husband and I have a HA podcast episode with him in it and he talks about what it's like to be with me <laughs> um, so this person's acknowledging that I'm married and I had a a husband the whole time I was in HA, so it's not like I'm highly experienced with dating and having it, but I understand a lot of people are really nervous about going on dates with boys and being in this weight gain phase. So here's my two cents. Here's my advice to you, one girl to another, we're sitting down for coffee and you're talking about boys. So if she or he is meeting you for the first time prior to your HA recovery, your active eating more, exercising less phase, you know, they didn't know you before. So the joy is you're not starting with any kind of identity there that they associate you with. But it is important at some point of your dating when things start to get a bit serious, to be honest. And it might come up at some point and if it's important to you and something you want to share with them and something you want to see if they're a good partner to support you through, this is just an opportunity to test the waters. And you know, you can explain HA, I think, to someone, especially someone you're dating, without making it sound weird, and I would totally do this. I would absolutely bring it up. But you know, if we started talking about like my athletic history, I would probably segue it from the fact that I'd been training a lot, but I'm actually not right now because I'm dealing with this thing called HA. I would just drop it super casually and they would be like, what's HA? And I'd be like, well, it's actually really interesting, but when girls train too much and they don't eat enough to, to handle that training, it actually messes a bit with their menstrual cycle. So I'm just sorting that out. Women's health problems, you know, and you don't have to go into depth and be like, oh, I'm not getting a period and like I'm not ovulating. You know, sport, under eating, over exercising, accidentally caused some menstrual cycle issues working on it. So it's really cool and fun because it means that I'm eating more food and I don't have to work out as much as I was before. And you kind of, you can make it lighthearted and it's not scary for them. It's definitely not scary for someone to hear that you're eating a little bit more and working out less. Like, what does that even mean? You know, they don't know what it even means for you to eat more and to work out less. So you're starting kind of vague. You don't have to get into it. And then as your relationship progresses, it's going to become more and more natural for you to talk about it. And when that time comes, right, when you're getting a bit more serious and maybe you're having a bad day and you actually need some support, you don't want to catch your partner totally off guard where they're like, I thought she was totally okay with this and now she's freaking out. So it is important to mention that it's hard work and that it can be emotionally challenging and shit, they, they should not be stupid. <laughs> they should know that the society we live in is really hard for girls to feel good about themselves. So, you know, they're not going to be shocked when you say, I've just been having to gain a bunch of weight lately and it's been hard for me emotionally because the world is messed up. Say it how it is. Don't beat around the bush. Be clear with your communication and then be really clear with what you need from them. So, sorry, I'm human and I'm having a bit of a bad day just around my body image because of this thing that I'm going through and I just like you, so I felt like telling you. 
this is a part of your life and a part of your journey and your history. And for a lot of people, it's a massive turning point in their life. So if you're dating someone, as soon as you feel ready to share, you should start planting the seeds that this is something that you're doing and is important. And you know, just avoid sounding like a psycho. <laughs> That's all that they want from us. Carly asks, how important is eight hours of sleep for recovery? Dude, sleep is so important. Look, when you've been in a deficit for so long, an energy deficit, total energy deficit, under eating, over exercising, stress, the whole shebang, your body is like ready for a nap. It's ready to shut down. We actually don't know a whole lot about what's happening to our bodies while we sleep which is fascinating in and of itself, just how much we don't actually know about the human body, but we need to sleep. And that's one thing we know for sure. A lot of girls experience coming into HA and then suddenly being more sleepy. Their sleeping habits improve. They wake up way later than usual. They are ready to go to bed pretty early on. It's really interesting to see how your sleep patterns change when you start to reduce stress when your cortisol response starts to slow down at the right time at night and starts to wake up a little later during the day. This is a sign that you're less stressed. Getting enough sleep is literally repairing your body from what happened yesterday to what is happening today. The more sleep you get, the less of a deficit you're in. If you're someone who is working through recovery and continuing to exercise, Woo! Sleep is extra important. It is extra, 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 extra important because you are continuing to take from your body and not put back in if you're not getting sleep. Okay. So sleep is a part of, is a part of replenishing what you've taken from the day. It's so important. There's a great book called Why We Sleep. I recommend you read that book if you're interested in learning about why why you need to sleep and, and getting the evidence for the amazing benefits of sleep. I'm not a doctor of sleep by any means, but I mean, it's just no question that if you're recovering from anything, any kind of injury, a broken bone, sickness, hypothalamic amenorrhea, sleep is where that shit gets fixed up. There's this really cool study where they took babies, for example, and they took babies who were going to have a nap and babies who they were going to sleep deprived from their usual nap. And prior to each, they showed a baby how to do something. Once babies are like over, over about nine months onwards, you can show them something and they'll try to imitate it. So these scientists took toys and they showed the baby how to do something with the toy. And then the baby copied it, learned how to do it. And then they put half of the babies to sleep for their nap and the other half, they kept them awake. And then an hour later or whatever it was, they brought them back in and they redid it. Like they gave the baby the toy and to see if the baby remembered how to do it. The babies who had the nap remembered how to do it immediately, were in a good mood and were happy to play with the toy as was shown to them. And the sleep deprived babies did not know how to play with this toy. They just like, they didn't, replicate it. It was conclusive. And that's fascinating. It shows you that our bodies learn, adapt, grow, and get better and smarter and stronger while we sleep. And we see this evidence in all types of places from athletic performance to academics. So it just shows you that when you're sleep deprived, you are underperforming and undernourished and your body literally wires the signals it needs to signal while you're sleeping. That's why there's the saying that you should sleep on it and you'll get clarity. HA is a brain thing, right? It's your hypothalamus trying to send signals to your reproductive organs to release the hormones it needs to release to make things happen. So if we are feeding ourselves and we want, we want to send the signal to our brain that we're safe enough to turn those processes back on, we need to do the work during the day and then we need to sleep on it. And while we sleep is actually where the magic is happening. Yeah, sleep. That's it for today. If you have a question you'd like to submit, please follow me on Instagram. I ask for questions every few weeks and I'll see you guys later. Bye.